from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 55, recorded on February 24th, 2025. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. Hello again, Paul. This is the video version of Paul's column on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. If you want to go read that, we'll put a link in the show notes. Today, we're going to take a closer look at Paul's recent column called Anti-Vaccine Activism Hurts Children with Autism. So let's start, Paul, by giving us an overview. You start the article by talking about Trump's involvement in vaccines and autism. Right. So in the run up to the, the election in 2016, during presidential debates, um, Donald Trump said several times that, you know, vaccines are given in too large of a dose, that he knew of a two and a half year old child who had received a, a vaccine, these horse level doses of vaccine, had a high fever, was sick and then ended up with autism. And that, that were he president, he was going to do something about that. So th these were a series of tweets that he had during that run up to the 2016 election. And I just, I know there's no answer to this question, but what did he know that hundreds of physicians and scientists who worked on these vaccines and involved in their approval and so forth didn't know? <laughs> right. He pretty much assumed he had found something out that nobody knew about. And, and it went a couple steps further that worried people at the time. Um, when he was elected president in 2016, and he had a series of inauguration balls, Andrew Wakefield, you know, the discredited UK doctor who had published that paper in Lancet that was later retracted, claiming that the combination measles, mumps, rubella, or MMR vaccine caused autism, was invited there. And he kind of took a selfie uh, talking to himself about how he was hoping to meet a uh, someone who was influential or people who were influential while he was at this inaugural ball so that he could, you know, d save children from autism. And um, so people worried about that. And then I remember this well at the time, um, RFK Jr. appeared at Trump Tower, came down and, and, and said something in front of many members of the press that he had just discussed with now President Trump to be the head of something called a, a Commission on Vaccine Safety and Scientific Integrity. President-elect Trump was very thoughtful on the issue. He asked me to chair a commission on vaccine safety. Vaccine safety. Yeah. And so everybody was worried that the anti-vaccine people now had much more access to policymaking, but it really mm -hmm. didn't happen, at least not in that first term. So, so Wayfield gets invited to the inauguration. You or I didn't get invited, of course. And um, this, despite his paper on the link, supposed link between autism and MMR vaccine, being withdrawn, discredited, shown to be fraudulent, many studies done showing no connection, yet he persists in saying there is one. Right. Um, and that was consists, continues to be worrisome and now even more worrisome because what's happened now is he um, now with this election for, you know, in 2024, uh, we now have um, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as Secretary of Health and Human Services. And when RFK Jr. appeared before the Finance Committee or appeared before the Help Committee, which were both confirmation committees, he was asked several times to support the, 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 the studies that have consistently shown that vaccines don't cause autism. And he consistently refused to do it. He did. He wouldn't rest on a single study. Right. And all studies can be methodology. Okay. okay. Don't mean but to be rude. I don't have a lot of time. Just saying we You don't. would not be, I just heard you say you would not, could not be happier if you were proved wrong. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I asked to put into the record 16 studies done by uh, scientists and doctors all over the world saying that vaccines do not cause autism. Are right. you happy? He still holds on to this belief that vaccines cause autism. And worse, when he stood in front of uh, members of HHS to outline his agenda, he said that, you know, that chronic diseases are at an all-time high and we need to look at things. We can't have any taboos. We need to look, look at things we've been unwilling to look at in the past. And then the first thing he mentioned was the childhood vaccine schedule, which has been thoroughly studied, especially regarding this issue. Some of the possible factors we will investigate were formally taboo or insufficiently scrutinized a childhood vaccine schedule. 
So it tells you that he has a bias. It's unshakable, immutable, fixed, science-resistant bias. And I worry for children in this country. So despite these uh, tweets of Trump, as you had mentioned, once he was uh, president, then, of course, COVID came. And um, he did respond to that. He started Operation Warp, Warp Speed. So he, did he forget about his anti-vaccine stance? I guess I mean, there was an article in the New York Times that said, you know, he's, you know, that he's 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 a hero for vaccines, <laughs> and obviously he gave eleven billion dollars towards the development of the COVID vaccine. And when he, he stood up at a rally in Alabama, realizing that a third of the country simply refused to be vaccinated, he said, "You need to get your vaccines," and he was booed. I recommend take the vaccines. I did it. It's good. Take the vaccines. But you got no. That's okay. That's all right. So he never said that again. But he, you know, he certainly at that point, you could argue he was one of vaccines heroes, at least back then. But now in his second time around, <laughs> he's spinning a different tune. Obviously, he's got RFK there as head of HHS. Um, <clears throat> so what what why is it flawed to conclude that vaccines cause uh, autism? Well, it's the hypothesis continues to shift. Um, vaccines are a universal scapegoat. I mean, they're given to virtually everyone in the first few years of life, and they're designed to protect against vaccine preventable diseases, not everything else that can happen in life. So from the standpoint of the parents, it's understandable. My child got a vaccine. They were fine. Now they're not fine. Could the vaccine have done it? And that is an answerable question. It's not easy to answer those questions retrospectively, but they can be answered. So study after study after study, looked at children who got MMR vaccine and compared them to those who didn't, making sure you're controlling for those potential confounding variables like healthcare seeking behavior, socioeconomic background, medical background. And those studies have been done now in seven countries on three continents uh, involving at least dozens of studies and thousands and thousands of children and MMR doesn't cause autism. And then the hypothesis shifted. No, it's not the MMR that's causing autism. It's thimerosal, this ethyl mercury containing preservative in vaccines that's causing autism. Those studies were easy to do. I mean, Western Europe had taken thimerosal out of vaccines in the early 90s. There were Canadian provinces that used thimerosal containing vaccines right next to Canadian provinces that used the same vaccines that didn't contain thimerosal. So those were easy to do. We, we stopped using thimerosal containing vaccines for children less than four by 2001. So it was really easy to do those experiments. And again, it wasn't thimerosal. So then it sort of morphed again. It's sort of too many vaccines given too soon cause autism. And, uh, you know, so it's whack-a-mole. You never, ever make people convinced that vaccines don't cause autism, although I will say this. There have been studies done by groups like the Autism Science Foundation in New York that looked at the, the, the question when Wakefield first brought up the notion that vaccines cause autism in 1998. They would ask parents, do you think vaccines cause autism? Parents of children with autism. And 90% said yes. Now it's closer to 15%. So those studies do matter. They do help, I think, the clinician and help the parent. And what really upsets me the most in all this is that people like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. or Del Big Tree act as if they're standing up for children with autism and they're doing the opposite. Yeah, Wakefield in particular, at the inaugural, he said, I'm looking for people who can help save the children. Right. And um, as I talked about in this piece that I wrote, I think, you know, first of all, the the what Donald Trump will say, for example, is, you know, vaccines, you know, have, have you know, were used to be a rare cause of autism, or, or that, 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 that autism was rare. Now it's common. You know, we've got one in 36 children who have autism disorder. Uh, spectrum disorder. That's an explosion of autism. It must be something. And thank God, Bobby is going to look at the childhood vaccine schedule. But a lot has happened regarding the definition of autism. Autism was first described by Leo Cano, Canner in the 1930s. And it was considered a rare disease, sort of being likened to schizophrenia. But then a lot of things happened. We broadened the definition. We had better diagnostic criteria. People were much more aware of the, this syndrome. I can definitely think of someone in my elementary school class in the 1950s who would have been on the spectrum, but we never heard the word back then. So now it's much more common. Um, and so that's probably the biggest reason for the increase. And, and the other thing is there's a lot of good leads on autism. I mean, the infant microbiome, which has now been associated with a number of things, obesity, uh, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, et cetera, um, is, is also sort of a promising lead. And genetics, there are, there's probably about 80% of autism is genetics. And it's not a single gene 
like sickle cell disease or cystic fibrosis, it's multigenic. But there are interesting leads on developmental disease, developmental genes that are expressed early in pregnancy. And, um, and there are drugs that are taken during pregnancy that clearly increase the risk of autism, malproic acid being one, viral infections uh, during uh, uh, while the mother is pregnant, like rubella, has increased the risk of autism. So there's promising leads that you never hear about. And you never hear about them because anti-vaccine activists have taken this story hostage for their own ends. Yeah, and, and it, it's possible that one day we'll understand the roots, the causes of autism, and... Um they will be suppressed depending on who is in charge in this government. Um, so the, the autism was first described in the 1930s, you say, right? That's right. As far as I know, there weren't many viral vaccines available then. No, you had, uh, so autism first described in the 1930s. What did you have? Um, you didn't have the polio vaccine yet. You didn't have measles, you didn't have mumps, you didn't have rubella, you didn't have varicella, you didn't have rotavirus. Um, in the 30s, you would have had the diphtheria vaccine and the pertussis vaccine. Yeah. That's what, and the smallpox vaccine. That's all you had. And, um, yeah, so some of those would be given to young children, but um, certainly not MMR, which Wakefield said is the culprit. So I don't understand that at all. Um, so let me get this clear. The, the idea now is that it's the large quantity of vaccines given together at a young age, that's what's causing autism? Well, the hypothesis always shifts. That, that's, that, that <laughs> sort of, that, that I think, yeah, I think that the, if, if you ask me the question, what question do parents ask the most, it's that. It's the concern that, that we give a, a lot of vaccines. I mean, we, we do ask a lot of parents. We um, ask them to um, get vaccines to prevent 14 different diseases in the first few years of life, which can mean as many as 25 inoculations during that time and five shots at one time to prevent diseases most people don't see using biological fluids most people don't understand. So I think it makes sense that parents would be skeptical. And I think that's it. It's just we're overloading their immune system with all these antigens and they can't handle it. And that somehow leads to chronic diseases. Is that a valid argument? Uh, it's an understandable concern, but I don't think it's a valid argument. I mean, if you it's really not the number of vaccines that matter. It's the number of immunological components in vaccines. I mean, that's the question. Can your immune system handle all this? And, you know, we've had advances in things like protein chemistry and protein purification and recombinant DNA technology that has allowed us to make safer, purer vaccines. We did get one vaccine 100 years ago, which was the smallpox vaccine. The largest of the mammalian viruses has about 200 structural and non-structural proteins, which I would argue is more in the way of immunological components than all the vaccines given combined today. And certainly, if you get a bacterial or viral infection, then you're getting way more antigen than any vaccine and probably all the vaccines combined. Certainly. I mean, yeah, bacteria are big. You know, they have more than 3,000 immunological components. Uh, viruses are littler. But, but because they continue to replicate, it's a much greater challenge to your immune system. Yeah. Is, do you think that autism is the biggest driver of anti-vaccine sentiments? Or is there something else? Um, I think it's the certainly it's the biggest in Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s mind. I mean, it's the one that he keeps talking about. That's, I would say that's it. I mean, the, the, it's when he continues to talk about chronic diseases. I'm not sure what chronic disease he's talking about. Is he considering obesity a chronic disease? And then the type 2, hyper, type two diabetes or hypertension as a consequence of obesity. Is that what he means by, by an increase in chronic diseases? I mean, I'd certainly agree with that. Um, but, you know, it's interesting. He says, you know, that we we spend a lot on our health care dollar per capita. And yet, if you look at um, longevity or infant mortality, we don't compare very well to other countries. But if you look at other countries that, that are high on the list, like Morocco, for example, or Singapore, um, they have vaccines. I mean, the difference is they have national health care system, which is probably the biggest predictor of how well you'll do. Mm. So one of the points you, in your article is uh, what happens to siblings of children uh, with autism in terms of vaccination. Yeah, this is what is the most upsetting. I mean, by targeting vaccines as a cause of autism, what's happened? It means that, that as shown in a recent journal of the American Medical Association paper, uh, children with autism are less likely to be vaccinated. And their younger, healthy sibs who don't have autism spectrum disorder are also less likely to be vaccinated, which doesn't decrease your risk of autism. It only increases your risk 
of vaccine preventable diseases with no benefit. So I think in, in when Andrew Wakefield says that he's helping children with autism or Robert F. Kennedy Jr. says he's helping children with autism, they're doing the opposite. They're hurting those children by exposing them unnecessarily to preventable illnesses and frankly taking hostage a lot of money that could be much better spent looking at far more promising research leads. So this uh, measles outbreak in Texas, which is now over 100 cases, is that in part due to uh, concerns about autism? Yes, yeah, so it, it's um, it centers on a religious community, which off, is often the story. That was the story in the Netherlands in 1990 to 1991. That was the story in Philadelphia in 1991 to 1992. That often have, uh, in that case, in West Texas, it's a Mennonite community that's undervaccinated. So they have a vaccination rates of around 80 percent. If you looked in the Netherlands or Philadelphia, the vaccination rates were zero percent. Um, which led to much bigger outbreaks. But we'll see. I, I think that this country is about to become dotted with measles mm-hmm. outbreaks in, with under-vaccinated pop- populations. It's, it's worries me. And if fantasies could come true, I would like to see someone ask Robert F. Kennedy Jr. the question, do you think measles outbreaks are caused by measles virus? Because in Samoa, he didn't. He thought it was caused by a defective measles vaccine that was circulating. And then if you do think it's caused by measles virus, are you going to encourage measles vaccination? as head of HHS. I'd like someone to ask him that question because I'm going to tell you right now, he won't answer it in a straightforward manner. He'll equivocate. Well, that's the, that's the thing I get down to in the end. Uh, what's his motive? We have decided it's money, right? Because the, the, there's so much evidence that counters everything that he says um, that it has to be something else. And, and of course, he makes money uh, doing this. Would you say that that's correct? We, we has. I mean, certainly, I mean, in, in the previous year, he sues pharmaceutical companies. And then um, if he's not the one directly doing the su- suing, but he, he comes upon a case, then he'll refer it to another uh, personal injury lawyer who will give him a certain percent kickback, finder's fee, if you will. So that's how he makes his money. And, and when Senator Warren asked him those questions at the help of uh, committee hearing for his confirmation, she pointed out that the obvious conflicts of interest there. I'm asking about fees from suing drug companies. Will you agree not to do that? You're asking me to not sue drug companies, no, and I'm not going to agree to that, Senator. No, you sue drug companies as much not, as you want. I'm not going to agree to not sue drug companies or anybody. And um, are you willing to give up that money? And he said no. He wasn't willing to give up that money, even though he could definitely influence how much money he could get based on his position. And then later, uh, I think the next day, he recanted and said that he, he, he would give it up, but he would give it to his son. Yeah, which is not much different, right? I don't think it's different at all. Keeps it in the family. But what about the president? What are his motives? Is uh, Are they political or monetary or wanting to be a hero? I don't know. It's wanting to be popular. And I think he sees this so-called medical freedom movement as a movement on which he can capitalize. You know, don't let the government tell you what to do. You know what to do. And and if you look at Project 2025 for the CDC, it says it wants to eliminate CDC as a recommending body. Just leave it up to the parents. Leave it up to the doctors. They, They know enough. You don't need to have this central agency making a recommendation. It's just an anti federal government move. I see that now the president has said any school district that mandates COVID vaccinations will not get federal aid. So we're just starting now. Well, they don't mandate COVID vaccines. So he's, it's an empty threat now. But if he were to extend it and say any school that mandates a vaccine would lose federal funding, that would be a problem. But the point is, is that mandates are valuable. And, and certainly school mandates have eliminated measles from this country in 2000. It's coming back because parents are choosing not to vaccinate their children. All right, we'll put a link to the column in the show notes so you can go read it. That's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.